coming up, we're going to go behind the top 10 songs of this very same week from the year 1982. That's not all, though. After we count them down, we're re-ranking each song according to all-time streams and views you know, to find out which song has made the biggest mark in history. What's the real number one hit? So what do you think will take the top spot today? Is it going to be a veteran band like Journey? previous chart-topping act like Rick Springfield or maybe Jay Giles' band, maybe a surprise one-hit wonder, or maybe an 80s hit machine like Michael Jackson or Huey Lewis. Stick around. You're going to find out if any of these contenders can make a run for the top spot. I'll tell you this, you're going to be surprised. Coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies. Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists, and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you faithfully listen to Casey Kasem's American Top 40 every week to see where your favorite songs ranked, then you're gonna dig this channel of musical nostalgia, especially today. Now make sure that you subscribe below right now to be a part of our Music History Daily, straight from the artists, and you also to become an honorary producer on our Patreon, click on the link in the description. Plus you can check out our new merch, including our POR shirts below. So guess what, my friends? It is time for another edition of our well-traveled countdown show, The Hit Song Redux. This is where we travel back to a week in the golden era of the rock and roll era, and we re-rank the top 10 songs of that specific week based on how much the world has listened to them since their peak position on the Billboard Hot 100. It's actually really cool because it gives us real insight to what the real number one hit is. As always, we include artist interviews, in-depth commentary, as well as your stories, your dedications. Okay, I wanna make sure that I'm very clear on this because still some confusion out there. This is not my personal top 10, and it's not even the top 10 for the whole year of 82. It's the actual top 10 from this exact week back in 1982. First, we count them down as they were, and then we run them through a recalibration process to find out what the real top 10 is based on all time streams and views. Now, before we get started, I have to give a shout out to my hero, the great Casey Kasem and his program, The American Top 40 Countdown. This show is like my tribute to him. I never missed a week. All right, as we begin, let's get into the proper pop culture context of the day and talk movies and television to start out. If you went to the movie theater around this time, you could catch a young Tom Cruise in Taps. Lady, if my son can be involved in it, your son can be involved in it. Or you could uh, see the supernatural horror flick, Cat People. <laughs> or the inspiring sports drama, Chariots of Fire. Chariots of Fire has received unanimous critical acclaim. And if you turn on the TV, you might tune into the Tom Selleck classic, Magnum P.I. <laughs> or the sixth season finale of Dallas, Or you can watch the final few episodes of WKRP in Cincinnati. Classic. WKRP in Cincinnati. It was a great time to be alive. It's for Saturday morning cartoons, Spider-Man and his amazing friends. Spider-Man and his amazing friends. And the Smurfs. You may just catch a glimpse of the Smurfs. We're both at the top of the list. So, all right, let's get started. Coming in at number 10, it's the brave little bar band who could. It's Do You Believe in Love by Huey Lewis and the News. Do you in love? Do you? You know, no doubt about it, Huey Lewis was one of the premier acts of the 1980s. Uh, tuning in a slew of Hot 100 hits. In fact, from 83 to 88, Huey Lewis and his band The News had 11 top 10 hits and two number one albums. Now the feeling... Back then, they had a five-year run that you could put up against just about any artist or act in the rock era. Actually, Huey was one of only seven artists in the rock era to release at least two albums with at least four top ten hits each. It's a group that includes uh, the likes of Michael Jackson, Whitney Houston, and Madonna. Huey Lewis has had too many hits, uh, really for us to mention here, but his highest charting singles were Power of Love. It's the power of love. Stuck with you. Happy to be stuck with you. Yes, it's true. And Jacob's ladder. Just a pair of angels. 
all of which went to number one. But before he put together that amazing run, Huey kicked off all of it with his breakout single, Do You Believe in Love? Here's what Huey said about it. Most, most of the stuff we wrote, but I called Mutt just to cover our bases. Mutt's a good friend of mine and said, hey, you got any songs you know we could do? And he sent, we both we believe, both in, believe love. in love. Yeah. And I rewrote the lyric a little bit and, um, and we cut it. And uh, just as a, as a kind of a, make sure we had our bases covered and it was our first single. Coming in at number nine, it's a Yacht Rock classic with a tip of the hat to Humphrey Bogart. It's Bertie Higgins with Key Largo. Key Largo, of course, an island off the coast of Florida. Key Largo, a lonely island off the coast of Florida. Sultry. A singer-songwriter, Bertie Higgins, actually grew up in the Sunshine State, and he spent a lot of time in the Florida Keys. Key Largo is also the setting for the 1948 movie of the same name that stars Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall. The song it's based on the movie, as well as Higgins' own failed romance. What Higgins said about it, I lived with a girl a long time in Florida. Her name was Beverly Seberg. We used to watch old movies on the weekends, and to us, the Bogart and Bacall romance was a phenomenal one. Bev left me, and I hurt for about two years. Finally, I said, well, I've got to reach her somehow, and the only equipment I had to reach her was this song. So I wrote this song, Key Largo. Wrapped around each other it was a plea for her to return to me, and she did. We became engaged. Actually, the couple got married a year after the song was released, and uh, Higgins wrote Key Largo with his producer, Sonny Limbo, who suggested incorporating the Bogart line, here's looking at you, kid. He's looking at you, kid. You know, that one into the lyric, even though he didn't say that in Key Largo. Here's looking at you, kid. Except in Casablanca. Key Largo was actually Higgins' only big hit. It topped out at number eight on the Hot 100, and it reached number one on the AC charts. Uh, Birdie followed it up with the title track to his album, Just Another Day in Paradise. Just another day in paradise. No. That one went to number 46 on the Hot 100, to number 10 on the AC charts. Now, through the years, Higgins would continue to release a number of albums and singles, and he actually recently dropped a Greatest Hits album in 2021. Sailing away to Key Largo. Coming in at the number eight spot, it's the greatest living musical genius, Mr. Stevie Wonder with That Girl. That girl thinks that she's so fine. Now, Stevie Wonder played as a one man band on this track. He manned the piano, the drums, the harmonica, Fender Rhodes, and the synthesizers. That girl thinks that she's so that Girl was one of four new songs on Wonder's 1982 Greatest Hits record, uh, Stevie Wonder's original Musicorium. The 80s started off strong with Stevie Wonder. He had a million seller record with Hotter Than July. Next to the label, they wanted this Greatest Hits record, but Stevie wanted it to be a double album with four new songs on it. First single was That Girl. It hit the charts in December of 81. Unfortunately, the album wouldn't be released until the following May, so that girl was basically promoting an album that wouldn't show up for another half a year. Said one of the record guys, I'd lay odds that Stevie and Motown lost sales of a million albums by releasing it so long after the single was a hit. We wasted a whole hit. So as we arrive at the number seven position, I want to recognize our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. You know, it's simple. Zenny has the best quality prescription eyewear for a truly cost-effective price. You design them, you can see what you look like with Zenny's mirror feature before you buy. Just click on the info button right up here to click on our special POR link to get the best price. You're going to love it. Coming in at the number seven position, it's Journey with their biggest hit. Now, believe it or not, Journey has never had a number one hit. Uh, the closest they come was this little ditty at number two the power ballad extraordinaire, Open Arms. Of course, from the smash album Escape, 
and the heavy metal original film soundtrack. This song it found a new life a few years ago on a big episode of the Netflix series Cobra Kai. I was privileged to sit down with Journey's Neil Sean and Jonathan Kane, and they told me about this song. Here's what they had to say about it. So I just became this big glue part, you know? And I took Steve and Neil and I put some glue and we just like that. And I said, oh, I like this idea. Steve wanted to sing a ballad. I said, I have this song called Open Arms. What do you think? Help me finish it. And we're like, you know, sold out everywhere on an escape tour. And um, we never played the song live. And Steve goes, I want to play that song tonight. And John, they both wanted to play it because they both, you know, wrote it and or John wrote it with him. And, and I was, uh, really? Where are we going to put that thing? You know? And so we stuck it in the set and the place came unglued. So our viewers also had a lot to say about Open Arms. Here's a couple of the comments that we received from viewers. Viewer George Harris said, I first heard Open Arms when I saw a midnight showing of heavy metal in college. It's been my favorite Journey song ever since. Boy. Harry? Viewer Linda O said, the most romantic night of my life was spent slow dancing in the club to open arms. My boyfriend at the time was a bouncer at our favorite nightclub, and after hours and after he closed up for the night, we met on the dance floor and he turned off all the lights except for the disco ball, and we slow danced to open arms, just the two of us. It was magical. I'm flooded with chills and memories every time I hear the song now. Coming in at the number six position on the countdown, it's singer turned actor Rick Springfield with the lead single from his follow up album after hitting number one with Jesse's Girl. The underrated hit, Don't Talk to Strangers. Yeah, on VH1's Behind the Music, Rick Springfield said that he wrote this song uh, while he was in New York taping General Hospital episodes as Dr. Noah Drake. I'm very happy to see you again. You remember. Oh, how could I forget? And then, you know, he'd do concerts on the weekend. Uh, said Springfield about the song. Don't Talk to Strangers was about my girlfriend who became my wife. I was screwing around on the road and I was worried that she was doing the same thing while I was away. So it was my paranoia to her. I'm getting laid, but don't you do the same thing because I'll be really upset. <laughs> Here's what Rick, he said that tongue in cheek. Here's what uh, Rick said about it in our interview. Well, that was the original title of Jesse's Girl, believe it or not. Yeah, I have it written in the margin of the song and crossed out. And Don't Talk to Strangers was one that, uh, that always stuck in my head um, and I thought would make a great title. My, my demo, my original demo of that, I played for Keith and he didn't pick it for the album. So I, I knew it was a good song. So I went back and recut it. I originally sang the chorus in falsetto. So I went back and recut it a little lower and sang it full voice and he really liked it. And it ended up being f the first single. Okay, so we've made it halfway through the countdown. And coming in at the number five position, it's a little pop ditty from the late great Olivia Newton-John. It's the very 80s hit, takes me right back, Make a Move On Me. Now, Make a Move On Me, that was included on Olivia's 11th studio album, Physical. It was actually the follow-up single to the record's number one monster title track, Hit, which spent 10 weeks at number one, making it the longest, most successful song of her career and the biggest of the 80s, as far as how long it was at number one. And Make a Move On Me didn't do half bad either. It came in at number five, went to number six on the AC charts, number four in Canada, and I think it went to number eight in Australia. Make a Move On Me, that became her 12th and final single to be certified gold by the RIAA. Now, the song was written by John Farr and uh, Tom Snow. Tom would call Make a Move On Me his personal favorite. He said it was a fun song to write. We started with a blank page, and over a period of two or three weeks, we pulled the tune out of thin air. When we recorded the track, John had me playing the underlying synthesizer riff over and over until it was perfect. Persistence, it definitely paid off. 
Again, this is a song that takes me back to the 80s. My parents always listened to ONJ, especially my mom. Workout, right? Heading into the number four spot, yet another grand follow-up to a really big number one hit. It's the Jay Giles Band with their single, Freeze Frame. Now this came on the heels of the number one hit Centerfold. Song about a guy who discovers his high school crush now features in a girly magazine. We covered it a few months back. Freeze Frame's subject matter, it's a bit less risque, though not completely innocent, but actually it's pretty creative. In this song, singer Peter Wolf recounts a memorable week with a girl he's fallen hard for, using all kinds of film imagery in the process. The week starts out with a rough cut Tuesday, but things pick up with a hot flash Thursday and a spotlight grind Friday on the dance floor. <laughs> Very 80s. By the time Wolf gets to Flashback Sunday, he's got quite a week to look back on. Calling it a, a zoom lens feeling that won't disappear. Now throughout the song, you can catch even more camera references, including snapshots, close-ups, dark rooms, and lines like, her face is still focused in my mind. But sonically, the song is just as clever. From its iconic keyboard, its backing vocals, the camera sound effects, and the repeating freeze frame chorus. I mean, just an irresistible piece of ear candy. No surprise then, it scored a number four ranking for actually uh, four weeks, four for four. <laughs> All right, we're getting closer to that number one slot. And in at number three, we have a piano piece written and performed by Greek composer, arranger, and musician, Vangelis. It's Chariots of Fire. Vangelis has had a, a massive influence on the development of electronic music and film scores. He started early, child prodigy. He gave his first public piano performance when he was just six. Later, he studied classical music and film at the Athens Academy of Fine Arts. In the 60s, he co-founded the group Formix. And it were just a warm September. Following their split in 1967, Vangelis wrote and produced for other Greek artists. He was also a member of the psychedelic prog rock band Aphrodite's Child, which claimed multiple European hits. However, they disbanded in 1972, and Vangelis spent much of the 70s working on soundtracks and solo albums. But the 80s, that would be his breakout decade, beginning with his work on the award-winning 1981 film Chariots of Fire. The movie is a historical sports drama based on the true story of British runners Eric Liddell and Harold Abrams. Uh, Liddell, a devout Scottish Christian, runs for the glory of God. And Abrams, an English Jew, runs to overcome prejudice. After years of training and racing, the two are selected to represent Great Britain in the 1924 Olympics in Paris. And there they compete and bring honor to their country. But you know, as, as compelling as the movie is, it really is Vangelis' score that has left the, the bigger mark on history, especially this iconic title track. So coming in at the number two runner-up position, it's the catchy, gets stuck in your head for days pop classic. We got the beat by the Go-Go's. We Got the Beat, it was actually written by band member Charlotte Caffey, who was inspired by Smokey Robinson and the Miracle song, Going to a Go-Go. I said Caffey about it. I thought it would be very clever to do Going to a Go-Go. I thought, well, let's try working this out as a cover song. I was listening to it a lot one day, and then later that night, We Got the Beat came to me within five minutes.
She'd also go on to say, I don't even know if it has anything to do with listening to that song. It was just one of those things that just went right through me and it came out of my hand. I wrote it down, I recorded it a little bit, and then I brought it into rehearsal a few days later. The Go-Go's released an early version of We Got the Beat in the UK as their first single. Uh, though it didn't do much, Our Lips Are Sealed was then released in the summer of 81. That went to number 20 on the Hot 100 and really opened the door. After gaining some traction, the Go-Go's released a new version of We Got the Beat that happened at the start of 1982, and it would turn out to be their biggest hit. It spent three weeks at number two. You know, if you remember, We Got the Beat also had a premiere placement in the opening scene of the 1982 classic film, Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Of course, there we meet uh, the main characters from the movie in their natural environment, the Ridgemont Mall. Uh, we got the beat. It actually doesn't appear on the soundtrack, though, if you remember, but it did get a lot of attention from the film. Our viewers had a lot of memories to share about this one as well. Uh, following the Fast Times at Ridgemont High thread here, screen name Cheesesteak22 said, We got the beat. Man, what an all-time classic. Every time I hear it, I'm instantly walking through the 80s mall, grabbing a slice of pizza with a pocket full of quarters. I'm at the arcade. They're playing Spicoli at Star Castle. <music> song started as a smash for early MTV and was in the rotation for years, bringing an all-girl band to the forefront of rock and roll and 80s culture. The nostalgia that songs bring is second to none. Way to go, go girls. That's pretty cool. Viewer Russell Klein said, I remember when the Go-Go's album first came out. I went to the record store and I bought it on cassette. And as I approached the counter, I saw that they had the new Rolling Stone magazine on display. And it had the Go-Go's on the cover. I grabbed an issue and I put it down with the cassette. The guy behind the counter smirked and said, going all out, huh? As I replied, why not? Love it. Also, screen name Samurai's mom said, I was already getting into the Go-Go's by 1982, but hearing them open Fast Times at Ridgemont High was so exciting. Both of those things epitomized being a teenager in the early 80s. Then they toured with the police. It was such a great time for music. All right, folks, we're finally here. We've made it the number one song from this very same week back in 1982. It's the sing-along rock ditty, I Love Rock and Roll, by Joan Jett and the Black Arts. I Love Rock and Roll was originally written and recorded as a B-side by the UK rock band Eros in 1975. Lead singer Alan Merrill called the song knee-jerk reaction to the 1974 Rolling Stones song, It's Only Rock and Roll, but I like it. Now later they re-released the song as a single, but it fell to chart and it fell into obscurity. The Arrows were often, uh, they're featured on a UK television show performing their songs live. And that's how Joan Jett discovered the song. She was touring in England as a member of the Runaways in 76, and she caught a performance of the song while in her London hotel room. Joan Jett was hooked on the spot. The energetic anthemic chorus screamed hit to her. She knew she had to record her own version. Unfortunately, none of the other runaways liked this song, so Jet held on to that thought. In 1979, she recorded her first version of the song with Paul Cook and Steve Jones of the Sex Pistols, who released it as a B-side. And finally, in 1981, Jet recorded the song with her band, The Blackhearts. This time, it became the monster hit that we all know and love. So we have a full version story of that. If you go back, I'll link to it. It's number one for six weeks, thanks in part to receiving heavy rotation on MTV. The first version of the video was originally in color, but it was later converted to black and white since Jet hated how you know, her red leather jumpsuit looked. Now, there were a lot of comments from our viewers about this one too. 
Here's just a couple. Screen name one is girl88 said, the first time I saw the video for I Love Rock and Roll, I just knew I was gonna grow up to be just like Joan Jett. The closest I've gotten to a stage is on a karaoke night. But it started my appreciation of female rockers. I'm thankful every day that I grew up in the 80s. Me too. Viewer Connie Bauer said, I was in ninth grade when I Love Rock and Roll came out and it was a big hit. I remember someone had a cassette player on the school bus and one day on the way home, the entire bus singing along with this song very loudly and making the bus driver totally crazy. <laughs> I love that. Well, there you have it. The top 10 songs from this very same week back in 1982. Now, before we give you the top 10, there are a couple of songs that peaked this week back in 82 that didn't make the top 10, but all these years later have had just as big an impact. So I'm gonna add them in as a little surprise to see how they fare all these years later against uh, the top 10 I just counted down. So here are the songs. Jukebox Hero by Foreigner. That peaked at number 26, it missed the top 10. Then there's the heavily sampled classic Genius of Love by the Tom Tom Club. That only went to number 31. So much bigger than its chart position though. And uh, Edge of 17 by Stevie Nicks. That just missed the top 10 by one placement. Okay, so let's put them through our recalculation system which focuses on all-time streams, radio plays, and views. Drum roll, please. Here's your new top 10. Kicking it off at number 10, we've got Freeze Frame by the Jay Giles Band with 33 million streams. Coming in at number nine is today's bottle lightning entry, Bertie Higgins and Key Largo with 37 million streams. Coming in at number eight, it's Do You Believe in Love by Huey Lewis and the News. Checking in with 56 million streams. Do you in love? Do you? At number seven, climbing into the top 10 for the first time, it's the Tom Tom Club's heavily sampled Genius of Love, which if you combine it with Mariah Carey's Fantasy, which definitely sampled the tune, Tom Tom Club would be your number one song this week. Very interesting. And number six, we got The Beat by The Go-Go's coming in with 87 million streams. And number five is the soundtrack instrumental Vangelis, Chariots of Fire with 111 million streams. Coming in at number four, you have Jukebox Hero by Foreigner with an amazing 165 million streams. All right, we're getting close. Let's name the top three. At the number three slot, you have Journey with Open Arms with an incredible 323 million streams. So I'm gonna tell you that the top two slots are a battle of great female artists. It's actually Stevie Nicks, whose Edge of 17 didn't even make the top 10 back in the day. And the reigning champion, Joan Jett with I Love Rock and Roll. Well, before I announce it, are there any guesses? Go to the comments right now and see if you can do it before I announce it. I'll tell you this much, it was very close. In fact, the final stream tally was 487 million streams to 451 million. So at the number two position, it's Stevie Nicks with the Edge of 17. And at number one, Joan Jett and the Blackhearts. Oh, what a finish. Here's what these classic songs sound like in comparison to the current top hits on the charts. I'm not saying a word. What do you think? Is top 40 music better 
now or was it better then? Tell us in the comments. So there it is, the new top 10 from this very same week in 1982 based on all-time streams and views. Make sure to share your memories of these songs. What do you think about the new top 10? Now, if we didn't get to your dedication or memory, we will. Keep sharing them with us in the comments. That means you, Anna. I'm sorry, we'll get to you, I promise. And don't forget to check us out on Patreon, check out our merch, help us keep the music alive. That's what the idea here is. One other thing, we're thinking about doing this top 10, even a top 40, and then recalibrate them as an actual radio show playing the full hits. Let me know in the comments if you'd like to see that, playing the full songs, getting artists in to talk about the songs and making it a, a big show like Casey Kasem's show back in the day. Let us know what you think. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Mm -hmm.